My guest today is Mr. David Kindersley of Cambridge, England, a stone carver, designer of letters, designer of type, investigator and researcher into optical spacing of letters, a sculptor, and many other things. And I think he will get into some of the other things that he has done. The first of all, I wanted to ask you, uh, David, uh, did you not have a, a kind of a different kind of education from what most of us have had to prepare us for a profession? Well, I, it's true I was apprenticed and uh, my father put down a small sum of money. Uh, I was apprenticed to uh, a well-known sculptor and typographer and letter designer, a man called Eric Gill. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, uh, your profession as a uh, letter carver and a typographer was something of a departure from your father's, was it not? Oh yes, very much so. Uh, father had been a stockbroker, or was a stockbroker, and a politician. And um, he, uh, I think, uh, was quite pleased in the end with what I did. But at the beginning, he, it was simply tolerate, toleration. Uh, perhaps you could tell us a, a little bit of, about what it was like to be uh, an apprentice of the famous uh, Eric Gill in his pastoral surroundings at uh, Pigots, I believe it was. Yes. It uh, was extraordinarily stimulating, uh, particularly in my case, because as you've just asked me, my background was completely different. I'd also been to an English public school, and uh, I arrived at this uh, place, which was simply so beautiful on top of the hills of Buckinghamshire. And, uh, here was this man who really was a revolutionary. Uh, he turned everything upside down for me. Uh, it was a very great experience. Well, in addition to uh, learning from this gentle man, who apparently was also a great teacher, uh, you had a few side duties, such as ch ch chasing the cows <laughs> back into the right pasture. And, uh, didn't he have uh, a sort of farm connected with Yes, it? there was a farm connected with the place. Uh, which his wife really ran. But we, uh, in the workshop, um, had an enormous number of chores to do, like uh, taking cow to bull and uh, bringing back the cows from miles away because the fences were never kept in proper repair. Uh, what was it like to, to be instructed by Mr. Gill? Uh, uh, how did he proceed to, to deal with one of his apprentices? Yes, well, I'm glad you asked that because I think one must point out that he didn't really teach. Mm -hmm. um, you went into this workshop and you were surrounded by people carving inscriptions day in and day out and doing other carvings. Mm -hmm. You started by uh, making the tea and sweeping up and that sort of thing, lighting fires, and you just picked it up. Um, there was no actual teaching. He simply used to say, well, here we make a letter A like this, or here we make a letter B like that, and uh, ignored, really, any preconceptions that you had yourself. Uh, now, Mr. Gill, who, who became quite famous in his time, uh, dressed a little unusually. Did he require that as a, uh, that of his apprentices also? No, uh, indeed not. No. no. <laughs> Thank goodness. So you didn't go, get to no. go about in a short cassock? Uh, no, no, no. No, that's right. No. I tried it once. <laughs> <laughs> didn't work. <laughs> Too drafty. <laughs> uh, now, did you leave Mr. Gill to, to go on your own, or uh, how, did, how did you finally come to your, into your own? Well, uh, I was apprenticed for three years, mm -hmm. and um, I left, I suppose, a couple of months before my apprenticeship was up. Um, Eric Gill was uh, a Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, he never proselytized, uh, but my fellow apprentices, apprentices did, and I found this uh, rather trying. Mm -hmm. And in the end, I rushed over one day and said, I'm afraid I've got to go. Um, and he said, I entirely understand. And I continued working for him 
in Sussex, where I moved. I see. Now, uh, what did you do when you went to Sussex? Uh, under what arrangement? Uh, well, I simply rented a cottage. And began business. Uh, and began business, yes. First of all, I started by um, doing some enormous um, carvings, um, which nobody wanted. And uh, when uh, I got my first commission to do a tombstone, I was absolutely delighted. <laughs> the carvings still lie buried in the garden of that uh, cottage in Sussex. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> well, maybe we could uh, jump forward a minute and uh, talk about your present quarters outside of Cambridge in this lovely old 13th century or 14th century tower. Yes. Well, I was very, very lucky. Um, I moved, first of all, uh, to Cambridge immediately after the war into some farm buildings which I converted into a house. And they were dated 1766. I then had to move from there and we uh, then rented a building which was built in 1340. Uh, it belongs to Trinity College in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. uh, it was uh, presented to the abbot of Vercelli in northern Italy. And he put a man in to uh, collect the rents from the cottages in the neighborhood. Uh, I guess that... Um, Did the abbot do that because he wasn't receiving his rents? Uh, yes, I think this was the point. I think that's why they built the place. Mm -hmm. um, and this man, it was his job to see the rents got back. I see. Well, tell us a little more about the tower, then. Well, the tower is really uh, the most beautiful place. Um, I'll show you some slides right. of that, if you like. I'm, good, I'm not quite sure now what the first one is, but we'll have a look <laughs> we'll anyway. See. Yes, there it is. Um, sorry about my car. The, um, there's a buttress you can see on the right. Well, that is the uh, medieval upstairs loo. I see. Uh, and that was a straight drop into a midden that ran straight to the cam. <laughs> so there was pollution in those days. I see. The nearest uh, projection is um, a, a solar, I guess. Uh, it used to have beautiful windows on every side. Uh, the roof, I imagine, is of a later date. In fact, I'm sure it is. Mm -hmm. And the turrets may have gone higher. I but see. basically, it's exactly as it always was. Could it we, was a residence. It was? Yes. Mm -hmm. Could we also see the inside and uh, what, it looked like, what it looks like? No, we're not. Well, you're not going to see that just <laughs> for the moment. Um, this is not really advertising. I was commissioned to do this. And I think I'd like to tell you a little about it. Good. Because um, there is a very famous slate in the Central Library in Birmingham, in England, mm -hmm. which was carved by Baskerville, the type designer and printer. And a man in Detroit asked me to do a similar kind of thing for myself. So it, it's his. It wasn't done as a piece of advertising. I see. Certainly. Anyway, we'll go on and have a look inside. That's the uh, downstairs of the building with these beautiful vaulted ceilings with lovely bosses in the center. There's a lion's head. There's a little head that is a sort of palindrome that you can see either way up as a face. It's all built of chalk. Is that right? Internally, um, which was the local stone. Mm. There is no stone in Cambridgeshire. The nearest stone is at least 45 miles away. Nice. Now, this is the way we all too often end the day. <laughs> um, but I think it's a civilized existence that we live in, in the workshop.
Now, are these your colleagues here? Yes, indeed. Um, nearest to me is David Parsley, who's been with me for many, many years. He came as a boy of 15. Uh, and then the young boy with long hair is Mark Bury, who is uh, developing into a beautiful glass engraver. And then the oldest member of the workshop is Kevin Cribb. He was actually apprenticed to me and to his father at the same time, because we worked together um, at a later period when I returned to uh, Eric Gill's workshops after Gill had died. Yes. Uh, perhaps this is the time, if you, if you think it's appropriate, where you show us a couple of your, uh, your main tool in uh, carving. I notice you have one over there on the table. Yes. Well, uh, this uh, is uh, what we call a letter cutter's dummy. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of people ask me um, why it is round. Wouldn't it be easier to uh, hit with a flat-faced hammer? Yes. But in fact, if you learn to use this, you can only hit it in one point where the greatest drive can be got. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it will slip either way. So if you learn to do this, you will get a much better cut. A flat hammer you can become sloppy with. I see. This is, I'm rather pleased with this. I turned this myself. And it is really exactly the same as the Egyptians, Egyptians used. Oh, really? Yes, they made them out of bronze. And only just recently have I got around to making this. What kind of metal is that? Uh, this is aluminium, in fact. And, um, We've been using um, iron-headed dummies with a wooden handle. And the wooden handle always comes loose yes. after a time. So that's a, a, an excellent tool, and I've now had a lot cast from it. It's a very pleasing shape. It is a nice thing. It's beautiful to use. We, we use, for small letters, a chisel just like that, which has, in fact, a tungsten tip. I see. And I now go around with a set of tools numbering no more than a dozen. Uh, until tungsten came in, uh, we used to go on a job with about 100 tools because they blunted so quickly and then had to be uh, re-tempered, redrawn out, and resharpened. So this is a great saving. These last for ages and ages and you can cut quite a long inscription without sharpening it at all. I know you uh, promised to uh, take along with you uh, slides of some of your projects. Is that what you have up next on the board? Uh, well, let's have a look uh, uh, and see. Oh, yes. Um, this is a, a well cover. Um, it's cast in aluminum. It's actually inside a house. Um, which uh, people were building this uh, house, and they discovered two or three wells. And um, they decided to keep one mm -hmm. and grow flowers around it. And they asked me to do this uh, aluminium cover. Mm -hmm. It's rather nice. It's got uh, a vine on one side, because the man is very fond of the grape in all its kinds. <laughs> Uh, the other is a, a, got a fish design, but I won't go into that, but it's uh, quite a long story. It's very pleasing. <laughs> now, I put this in, uh, simple as it is, because I, I like to show that we do like to make simple, useful objects. And this marks the uh, level above C on a man's estate in... Uh, Somerset. This is um, a letter obtained by sinking the background and leaving the letters projecting. The background is just rough pointed, and the surface of the letters are painted uh, just off white in a blue direction. Now, how do you sink the background? With a, a hammer and a, a point. Do you take a surface off? Yes, mm -hmm. yep. And then all around the edge, 
are the names of the aldermen and the chairman of the council and so on. And what kind of stone is that, or is it stone? That is Welsh slate. Welsh slate. Mm -hmm. And it's in the local police station is that uh, right? in Cambridge. Yes. I'm delighted that this uh, is amongst the slides I'm showing because, of course, uh, it was done as a present. Uh, not by me, I did it, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, the present was to Muir Dawson, who is such a well-known yes. uh, bookman here, yes, and um, who I've known for many, many years. It's very appropriate that you had a Southern Californian. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I owe him quite a lot <laughs> because he sold a lot of my work. I see. Now, uh, this is uh, just a sheer, sheer prettiness. Um, I think I must, uh, if you will allow me, tell you an amusing story about this. After she'd unveiled it, I was invited upstairs uh, to a reception and was introduced to Princess Anne. And, of course, I couldn't think of anything to say. And I suddenly remembered that her husband had been to the same school as I had been in Wiltshire. So I said, your husband was at the same school as me. And she said, well, it didn't seem to do him any harm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just think this, if I might say so, is a jolly fine inscription. Um, I mean, the letters. Yes. I'm not quite sure about the wording. <laughs> Um, I'm just the letter cutter. Yes. But um, it's a slate panel, and the letters are incised and then gilded, of course, with gold leaf, real gold, obviously. But, th but there is a, a very beautiful straightforwardness and simplicity about your work, I think, that uh, is outstanding. Well, uh, I, there is, but wait and see, because I'm not always straightforward. Oh, you're not always straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this was a very uh, fine thing to be asked to do. It's in St. Margaret's, Westminster, and it, is, uh, it commemorates the famous um, mm -hmm. etcher, and it was given by a man, as you see, from Montreal, who is a great book collector. And it is on a stone which uh, was used for lithography. Oh, is that right? And I thought it'd be nice to use a lithographic stone for a man uh, like uh, Wenceslas Holler, because had he lived a hundred years later, no doubt he would have been a lithographer. Uh, this is a very poor picture, I know, but it does give a, a three-dimensional quality. It's a coat of arms um, uh, for a very uh, go-ahead electronic firm in Cambridge. And um, it's carved out of Portland stone. It's about four foot nine high. And the relief at the top is about six inches. And it's pierced. Now, this is not meant to be gilded at all. This Indeed, is... it is. Oh, yeah. Yes. That's really why I'm showing this slide, because uh, it's so sculptural. But yes. uh, as you can see, oh, um, yes. it does lose some of that. Uh, sculptural quality when you paint and gild it. If you'll forgive me for saying so, I like it ungilded better. Well, I think I do, um, <laughs> as a piece of, piece of sculpture, but heraldry was always meant to be in color. Yes. Now, this is another slate that uh, Princess Anne um, unveiled. Um, I'm sorry about... You ought about... to be well acquainted by this time, then. Well, <laughs> a nodding acquaintance. <laughs> um, I'm sorry about the rather horrible um, emblem at the bottom, which belonged to the property developer. But it had a beautiful coat of arms at the top. But I show it because this is the kind of thing we're suffering from more and more, I'm afraid, in England. It's been horribly scratched all over by mm -hmm. hooligans. <clears throat> but fortunately, I was able to put it right. But we are suffering, I'm afraid, from this kind of thing. Is that a slate that it's on? Yes, on? it is. Now, this is a tablet, I think, about five feet across. And on the left is my uh, uh, colleague, David Parsley, 
and on the right is Kevin Cribb. It's a postgraduate college, fairly new, and the arms, starting from the left, are Gonville and Keyes College, St. John's College, Trinity College, and Darwin College. Uh, it's the Darwin arms impaled with the uh, donor of a lot of money to build the college, whose name I forget at the moment. <laughs> it's again a sunk panel, mm -hmm. leaving the stone raised for carving. And the whole thing is done in the workshop. All the masonry is done in the workshop. And we fix everything too. Yes. There's a sundial which replaces one which fell down, fortunately at midnight, uh, uh, <laughs> over the west porch of a church in Hertfordshire. Green slates this time from Westmoreland. Uh, or I should say Cumbria now, because they've changed all the counties. Uh, your, uh, your teacher, Eric Gill, did a uh, sundial, did he not, at the Clark Library here in Los Yes, Angeles? he did, yes. And uh, that's in Hauntonstone, and it's very charming. Yes. It really is a beautiful thing. It shows a, a boy, I forget if it was a boy or a girl, holding a sundial. Yes. It's a charmer. Here again is another sundial which is made from um, GRP, as we call it, which is glass-reinforced plastic. Um, it's eight feet high. The actual dial is made of armor plate glass. And so you can see the shadow uh, from either side and therefore tell the time from either direction. But sundials are just fun, really. They um, only tell the correct time twice a year. <laughs> um, the gnomon, the thing that casts the shadow, and I have zigzagging down into the ground, that is simply held in place by stainless steel wire. Mm -hmm. Then we're doing, we are doing more and more glass. This is a very large piece of glass. It was 80 inches across and uh, was done for the Post Office Research Center. And, uh, well, there it is. Uh, how, how do you work with glass? Do you do that by sandblasting or? No, no, we use a, uh, a diamond impregnated head I see. in a, an equipment exactly the same as a dentist uses. I see. It's a lovely medium. It is fun. And it's great fun when you can see the thing sort of backwards inside a glass and so yes. on. This was a wedding present uh, to, oh. I, I better read it. I think it's Rosemary and Richard, as far as I remember. But um, straightforward, not exactly. My sole aim here was to make something decorative, mm -hmm. which only after a, a little while would you realize uh, made letters. I've only got one bowl in here, but I've got uh, three in the uh, Museum of Modern Art in New York. This is a, an alabaster bowl, and as you can see, it's tra the light uh, its totally translucent. It's, it's a kind of a lalique uh, type uh, treatment of glass? Uh, no, this is no? alabaster. I see. It isn't uh, glass. It isn't glass. It's, it's, this one is turned. I see. I have a lathe oh, really? in the workshop. I misunderstood, yes. Yeah. I have a lathe in the workshop, which I'm very proud of. It's exactly my age. It was discarded as being too inaccurate for <laughs> metal work, but it's ideal for mm -hmm. um, marble and onyx bowls and things like that. This... Um, we did merely for fun. And um, I had no idea that I had so many friends whose uh, names started with S. And I'm afraid we had to repeat it several times, which became rather a bore. Yes. These are two um, slate boxes, which were given by the um, 
I forget now what they call themselves, the Crafts Council uh, of Great Britain, to the two leading living potters mm -hmm. uh, in the world at this moment, I think I could say that. One is Soji Hamada, a Japanese potter, mm -hmm. and the other is Bernard Leach. Yes. Uh, could you indulge me a minute uh, and let me ask you a question? How does one... Uh, uh, this isn't meant to be commercial, but I, I'm curious about the process. Uh, how does one get some work done by your organization? Uh, you just write you a letter and, and say that you're interested, and uh, uh, you begin this discussing the concept? Yes. And, uh, um, I'm, uh, I'd like very, to know about how things yes, work. Yes. I'm very keen on... Um, there, there seems to be... I haven't got any of this great uh, artistic temperament that we know about and hear about. Um, three things, or two people and one thing, have to be pleased. The client, I aim to please, but I must please myself just as much. Mm -hmm. The material must also not be violated. And these three things uh, combined is, uh, produces mm -hmm. uh, the end product. I'm very, very keen on that. Uh, I would have not done an awful lot of things if clients hadn't asked me to do the most crazy things, <laughs> which I would never have dreamt of doing mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. But by the time it's married up and you have produced your design, it generally turns out Rather interesting. So that what comes out of your shop uh, is only something that pleases you, among other things. Uh, yes, it's got to please the client and so on. Yes. I do, as you'll see later, a number of things which literally only please me. Mm -hmm. um, and, but fortunately, I'm able to sell them. <laughs> <laughs> Such as these alphabets. This, in fa this alphabet is, in fact, in the uh, Huntington Library. Oh, is it? And uh, I, think it, 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 I think it is a, a beautiful it is. thing. I, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that sort of thing. <laughs> but sometimes I feel like that, sometimes I don't. I have the a great good fortune of always being frightfully pleased with what I have just done. This, last, this euphoria <laughs> lasts for about 24 hours, and I live on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but then it vanishes, and then I see all the mistakes and grow very miserable about it. This I call the writing master. This it, is slate This again. is slate, and I've painted the letters orange-red. Now, these are the sort of things, too, that I do um, in a great sort of series. There was a set of 18 um, alphabets. They are, in fact, black line photo litho, and each one is hand-painted in gouache. So although there's uh, 18 different basic alphabets, uh, each one is a different color. So they are, in a sense, one-off. Uh, the one on the left I call Lombardic, and the one on the right, um, with apologies to calligraphers, I call a versal letter. This is a, a, an interesting technique for lettering. You cut round the edge of the letter, mm -hmm. um, and then... Um, uh, pitch out the inside, leaving it rough the way slate splits. And then when gilded, it has this wonderful um, sparkly sort of quality. Does a slate have a grain like some? Yes, uh, very, very stones? much. Gra a slate is entirely made of uh, grain. You can split it on the edge mm -hmm. endlessly, down certainly to uh, an eighth of an inch. Mm -hmm. But you always have to halve it. I see. Uh, but working on the face, 
such as these things are done. Um, it's one of the strongest materials you could possibly have. These are all only a quarter of an inch thick, uh, these slates I'm showing you. I show this because it is um, the Lombardic uh, alphabet that I made a master of in perspex. I forget what you call perspex here. Is it styrofoam or something like that? We have styrofoam, yes. I don't yes. know whether I mean that. A light plastic material? No, it isn't then. I've no. got it wrong. No. Anyway, it's quite a hard material. But this is uh, vacuum formed mm -hmm. uh, in styrene, a thin sheet of, st of styrene, uh, which is great fun. Here is the versal letter, which I showed you a little earlier, uh, carved in slate and painted. Um, I like to um, use designs again and again, but in different materials. I think this is, a, this is something I learned from Mr. Gill, who did uh, drawings for carvings, uh, which he then uh, made into wood blocks, mm -hmm. and then perhaps just simply made the drawings nice in themselves. The one at the top here I call calligraphic. What I do, which might interest some people, is that I always paint the letters first mm -hmm. and then do the background over the top of the letters, which gives a very interesting effect always because uh now you've uh, you've designed a couple of typefaces at least, haven't you? At least a yes, couple. Yes, I, I have. Yes, uh, yes, many more. Than what, what, a what are the names of some of them? Well, one I designed. Um, I think the first one I did was uh, with Will Carter, which we called Octavian, mm -hmm. which has now just been put onto film by Monophoto. Oh, yes. It was only available in metal before, mm -hmm. but I'm sorry to say they have um, copied the metal thing uh, exactly. All the advantages that can be gained from being on film hmm. have not been taken. The one on the left I call stick uh, boustrophidon. Boustrophidon mean, meaning uh, be, uh, being Greek for ox plowing. And about 500 BC, we used to write with the letters uh, going that way and then turning the letters round and going that way oh, and then sorry. going down. A very economical way of doing things. Um, unfortunately, it was discarded. <laughs> that would uh, help speed reading if we still did it, wouldn't it? Well, because I think it would. <laughs> your eye doesn't have to slide back. No, exactly, yes. And the one on the right is engravers. Now, this, uh, uh, these... Uh, painted alphabets that you've been looking at um, have enabled me to do a lot of things in stone which I wouldn't have thought of doing. Uh, is this carved? This or? is carved in slate and, then and it's really based on the stick kind of letter. It um, was put into a school for children and um, I said to the uh, council at the school that uh, it seemed unfair that the children should be reminded of Mrs. Needham's charity every day. <laughs> so I said, let's do something illegible, which uh, gradually they can discover. <laughs> and um, much to my amazement, they accepted the, the design. Mm -hmm. And um, it's on a split piece of slate. Nice. It's on a rough piece of slate. It's about six feet across. And I gather the children really do mm. quite enjoy it. Here is um, uh, an alphabet cut out of wood and painted. It's a, a Boustrophidon alphabet um, called Shatter. And uh, therefore, it can be read either way around. It really is a mobile. Fascinating. And uh, you get these marvelous shadows. Fascinating concept. The one on the right is called Flourish, and this one was so popular that it wrecked all my sets of, elf of 18 alphabets. 
Uh, in fact, they have now all been sold. And the one on the left I call English. And here you see um, I have carved the Flourish alphabet with modifications into slate. This has been done in solstone, uh, which is lithographic stone. Mm -hmm. It's been done in marble. It's been done in Portland stone. In fact, it's been done 11 times. It's very beautiful. People love flourishes. Yes. And, and so not do as I. straightforward <laughs> as the first one I come. No. Um, people seem really to like flourishes. And uh, so do I. So that's fine. These are Arabic numerals on the left. And the other one is called uh, op alphabet. It, all the letters are there. You must take my word for it. Um, it's appeared in a book recently called Lynx. And just by the side of the illustration is a thumbprint, which seemed to me quite uh, mm -hmm. a good idea. Now, these are two lithographs. Uh, they are completely lithographs. And I, did, I worked on the plates up in London at the Kerwin Press. The quote on the left is from Eric Gill, letters are things and not pictures of things. Um, the one on the right, which I've never really liked very much because it's so pompous, um, so I think I'll leave it alone. It is a quote from Oliver Simon. I didn't actually select these texts. I was commissioned to do these. I see. Then I went on to produce a series of sayings, which I call graphic sayings. The one at the top, I think, is legible enough in a sort of copper plate. But the one at the bottom may be a bit difficult to discern. But it's the significance of the dwelling is in the dweller. The one at the top is extremely difficult, but it's quite easy once you've got it. It is no problem, it is too difficult to be solved by a theoretician. <laughs> and the one at the bottom is, whoever has taught me one letter has made me his slave. The worker is hidden in the workshop. And I love the one at the bottom, which uh, it's rather difficult for me to read it from here, but it is to drown in treacle is just as unpleasant as to drown in mud. People today are in danger of drowning in information, but because they have been taught that information is useful, they are more willing to drown than they need be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can I ask you what treacle is? I'm sorry. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, what do you call it? it? A liquid sugar. Oh, I see. Syrup. A syrup. syrup. I'm awfully sorry. I've been. I've, I've encountered it in English literature yes. over and over again. It's yes. high time I found out what it was. <laughs> I'm sorry about sorry that. Sorry to do it so publicly. But, uh. <laughs> These are, are paperweights that I uh, do for people from time to time. And. Um, it so happens that this year I'm chairman of, the, of a society called the Wink into Words Society that uh, meets every other month for lunch at Stationers Hall in London. And every speaker that comes is presented with a, a paperweight with his initials on and the Wink into Words sun on the back, which we enjoy doing very much. It's a delightful idea, too. Then I do these book plates, which I love doing very much. I'm not, uh, I'm afraid, um, capable like Reynolds Stone, the famous English wood engraver, mm -hmm. who can work on a block the same size. These are, in fact, painted. I see. And then they're reduced photographically, and plates are made. As you see, Eric Gill uh, is there. Um, this was done for the Gleason Library, the Albert Sperrison collection. 
They're very, very pleasing. And, uh, well, we're the kind of thing that would enhance a book. Uh, well, that's nice of you to say so. I, I, I enjoy making them very much. There's some more. The one at the bottom left is um, Sidney Thomas Fisher, the man that r gave the tablet commemorating Wenceslas Holler. Oh, yes. And he asked me to do this sort of Eau du Bon uh, Kingfisher as a rebus on his name. Mm -hmm. BJF is uh, Brian Forbes, who uh, used to be uh, a great uh, film actor, and then started, uh, was chosen to try and um, uh, restore the British film industry, but uh, I don't know what happened. He very quickly stopped doing that, and now collects Napoleonic books, hence the B in the bottom. And he lives in um, the pines, hence the pine tree. I see. Uh, Basil Harley is uh, director of the uh, Kerwin Press, and therefore the Kerwin Gallery and the Kerwin Studios. He lives in the Martins, hence the Martins, and he collects bugs. I can never remember what that uh, <laughs> word is for doing that. Now. I, I, I'd like to say a little about this, if I may. This was one of the most interesting jobs that I've ever been asked to do, because it's combining two disciplines, uh, music and lettering, and I, I think probably an impossible thing to do, but so worthwhile trying. This was for uh, what would have been Stravinsky's 90th birthday. But in fact, you remember, he died. Yes. But they decided to go on with it as being a fitting memorial. And I think there were 15 uh, ballets performed. Uh, and these were the titles for them. And I got all the music. And I listened to it as I drew them. Mm. My wife read all the books and marked relevant passages so as I could uh, bear some things in mind. Ebony Concerto was the only jazz um, ballet music that he ever performed, hence the oscilloscope. Requiem Canticles was uh, for Martin Luther King. Argon, um, I saw after I had done this and realized that at least I think I had got the point. Orpheus, well, a slight Greek feel, and of course uh, he did look back, so I think one was justified in reversing some of the letters. Firebird, Circus Poker, which I understand was composed for elephants to dance to, but they always ran away when the music started. <laughs> Uh, but the elephant's trunk is there, in a sense. Capriccio, suite of jewels. These were commissioned by Lincoln Kirstein of the New York City Ballet Company. Um, I don't think the Song of the Nightingale is very good myself. I like the kiss of the fairy under the lake and monumentum. Fireworks was done simply with a kitchen mop. And Pulcinella, I think, was a, a, a nice one. Very, very suitable, I think. Polo, I think, just had to be like that. Well, now where I don't are we? Know. Where are we with the slide? <laughs> a great change, I'm afraid. Well, I. I got into awful trouble in England because I challenged the uh, legibility of mm. lowercase signs, which I'm afraid we had adopted very largely on the strength of um, uh, your work mm -hmm. in this. 
Uh, how uh, did you go about challenging? Uh, well, I just said that they were not as legible as capital letters. I see. Mm -hmm. um, and everybody got very bored with me. And in the end, there was a great conference held in, in the design center. And I think they thought they would kill me off by organizing uh, a great research, mm -hmm. which was done by the Road Research Laboratory. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, they were totally certain that their case signs would be best. Well, David, we have to begin winding this up. Have you got a last slide that you want to... Uh, yes, I have uh, one or two, I'm afraid. One or two Can I to... rapidly go okay, on? Okay, good. This was the beginning of my interest in spacing. This was a street name alphabet oh, yes. uh, that I designed for Cambridge um, uh, many years ago, in 1948, I think. And it had a spacing system. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was when I was doing that that I thought there was probably some sort of law attached to it. This was an electronic instrument that I built, very primitive, known in the... Uh, workshop was the elephant's backside. <laughs> uh, I was using a photoelectric cell and measuring light transmission mm -hmm. on a galvanometer. This was the first use of my spacing system for the university press. I didn't dare tell them, but afterwards, It'll when they approved, part. I told them that I'd not done it by eye. This I'm terribly proud of because it's the guts of the machine that I invented. It's a light wedge, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, it is uh, what is called a second moment wedge. Um, it's an inertia. It's the law of inertia. And this was painted by hand, every dot. This was when I started with the Cambridge Computer Laboratory, um, and we found that the results we'd been getting with our primitive machine were very, very accurate. But of course, this sort of thing is totally non-visual. A year later, they had acquired a machine which uh, had an enormous display. It's called a laser scan display unit. And this enabled me to try out all sorts of different mathemat mathematical progressions on letters mm -hmm. to find uh, their optical centers and to find their uh, spaces because the center and the space are one and the same thing. We even went up to fourth moments. And these are um, some examples. These are letters without any space between them, but four units between words. Here you have a space of 85, whatever that may mean, between letters and two between words beginning to get quite good. We then went into text, in capitals, I should have said, very pleasing. and then into lowercase. This is a, a tight version, because we can have any, it's a constant between letters, so we can do anything. Here it is, set wider. And here it is at 85 between letters. And this is my last slide. On the left is uh, my system. And on the right is uh, a normal um, printed version, nevertheless done by computer. Nice. So the actual image is not yet very good. But they're learning all the time, these chaps. Uh, the computer people deny they have any aesthetic sense. <laughs> and it's my job to reveal to them that the man has not been born yet that lacks an aesthetic sense, however hard they may deny it. Well, thank you very much. We've been uh, visiting today with David Kindersley, and he has concluded the program uh, with a discussion on his optical uh, spacing of letters and the system that he, he is an evolved. And I, for one, who spend a good deal of time uh, looking at letters and uh, at uh, computer-produced letters, uh, am very happy that you've engaged in this uh, latter research that you've shown us today. Thank you again. Thank you very much.